I'm Scott L. Miller. This is my everyday life living in Nicaragua. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the melancholy feelings you can get as an expat and some of the things that especially I, as a parent, sometimes feel and face raising my kids as expat kids because we do have uh, two children and we have lived abroad with them for about 10 years now. So this is a major part of our lives. I also want to address a little bit about schooling options here in Nicaragua. We're just going to touch on that lightly because people had some questions recently and it's good to go over these things because people do want to know. So we're going to get to that right after the bump. It's a gorgeous overcast weekend and I'm glad to be home here in Nicaragua. I've been out of the country for most of the week. I had work to do and so I was doing a lot of traveling and that's very tiring and of course I'm behind on the show. So uh, doing what I can to get caught up. I did manage to go out last night and record. I think it turned out I have not had a chance to audit it yet. A good show at Via Via with Rockman Braza. So I'm always trying to get some of that done for the Nika Roomba channel. If any of you have not checked that out, go check out Nika Roomba. That's exactly what it sounds like uh, uh, at Nika Roomba. Here here on YouTube, uh, where we do uh, concerts and uh, events and interviews from Nicaragua. It's really an arts scene and activities uh, video show, and they're long form concerts. So you want to see what a live show would be like here in Nicaragua. That's a great place to go check some out. We put a lot of work into finally coming up with a process that makes good videos there. So I'd love if people went out and supported that. Just watch some, subscribe, and so forth. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is the schooling question. A lot of times people are asking me what there are as far as options for school, specifically international schools schools and places where you can learn English or, or English speaking students can study. And so there's a couple challenges here. One is my children do not attend school physically in person here in Nicaragua. So I don't have firsthand information on this, even though I am a parent of school aged children who are doing their school here in Nicaragua. So that's the first thing. Second, nobody goes out and goes to lots of different schools. At most, you're going to have people who do a little bit of research around one city where they're living. Uh, finding someone who has knowledge across the whole country, uh, what's a available in all the different regions, no one's going to have that. And that's unfortunate because that's information that would be super handy for people to have. Uh, but unfortunately, you've got to find someone with kids in that particular market who has spent a lot of time researching. But let's talk about what people really do in the real world or what I think people are doing uh, and, and give some color to that. So first of all, sometimes I get questions about public school. No one who's coming to Nicaragua really wants to put their kids into public school unless maybe uh, unless, of course, you're a Nicaraguan citizen already and it's just you've been away. OK, maybe a little bit different. Uh, if you are natively Spanish speaking and you're able to send your kids to school, and they're 100 percent comfortable and capable of working in Spanish without accommodation, maybe. But the public school is really something that even Nicaraguans have a tendency to try to get away from if they're able to. There is a certain amount of pressure to get your kids into private school and a lot of uh, societal benefits to going to private school. So typically, uh, upper lower class to lower middle class families are going to start trying to get their kids into a private school. So if, as an expat who's going to be here automatically by law, uh, except unless you have a major exception, you're an asylum seeker or something, your income levels are going to make you a middle class uh, Nicaraguan or higher. And so it would be expected that if you are going to send your kids to school, the expectation is that you're going to send them to a private at school. It's also, under normal circumstances, not available to you to send them to public school. Maybe you could make a case for it. You might be able to plea. A school might just let your kids go. I don't know, right? You probably can, but officially, you don't get the right to send your kids to school unless you have a certain level of residency, which takes time to get. So moving into the country just to get residency to send your kids, like there's there's some, some gaps that are potentially going to arise there if your plan is to send them to public school, which of course is free. So typically, uh, an expat will never have either the option of public school or reasonably consider it. And that's fine. There's no reason to. So the way that you would typically work here is if you want to send your kids somewhere, you would use a private school. And this is mostly what people ask about, but sometimes people ask me about public school. So I want to make sure we cover it. As far as private schools, most of the country does have private schools. Like I said, Nicaraguans use them heavily. So their accessibility and availability is quite good. Here in Leon, we have a lot because we are an education city. So there's a ton of focus on that here. And just here in, in our own barrio, we have multiple very well-established private schools uh, with good track records and that are campuses available throughout the country. So you could even move from city to city and potentially stay within a system. For uh, for example, Calisans, La Salle, uh, and, and uh, Pureza 
all of them have multiple campuses around the country and all of them are available within a few minutes of where I am. So because of that, you could start one place and move to another if you're in one of those systems. There's plenty of other systems as well. They'll vary as to availability there. But all of these are Spanish primarily. I don't believe any of them offer real accommodations for English speakers. That'd be extremely difficult for the schools to do. And there are essentially no English speaking kids looking to go to those schools. In theory, there's one or two, but only one or two. So you're talking about extreme outliers. So if you have kids who are looking at going to these schools and they do not speak Spanish really well, this is going to be very difficult for them. So it's important to understand that that's just something that you're going to need to accommodate. And it may not be fair to your kids or it may not be a good idea for your kids in all cases to send them even to a really good school if they don't have that accommodations. Now, I'm sure in Managua that there are schools that have these accommodations, and I would assume in San Juan del Sur and possibly in Granada, places where you really do have a lot of English speakers because they're really concentrated for the most part. So Leon, for example, we're an education city. We have great high schools, great universities, but very few English native speakers, so the need for English speaking at any level of the education system is extremely low other than teaching English to Spanish speakers. So here you're going to find a lot of challenges around that. In other parts of the country, it'll be much easier, but in other places, right, non-touristy places, Madagalpa, Chinandega, the, you know, Boaco, you're going to find a much greater challenge than you would find in Leon. So if this is something you plan to do, you're probably going to want to do a lot of school research. And unfortunately, I don't know how anyone could reasonably do this on your behalf. Uh, if someone comes up with a great system for this, I would love to go around and show a bunch of schools, but we'd have to, one, track down a bunch of schools, two, take an enormous amount of time to, to get into contact with them, travel around, talk to them, and, and then get permission to go in and film them, show what they're like and such. It would be an unbelievable amount of effort. Um, and I don't think we would gather the kind of information that people are really looking for. Things like quality of education, we have no way to gauge, right? Uh, be very, uh, here we are looking at this school, but we're not seeing any uh, information coming back from it. We don't know how well the students are performing and so forth. So it's uh, very difficult to, to gauge in that way. And likewise, if you're going back to the United States or something and you wanted to go look at private schools. So first of all, if you're just in the United States, you're just visiting technically. You don't get to send your kids to public school. That's not normal. Uh, if you then want to use a private school, normally that's available to you. No problem. But gauging private schools is extremely hard and people have no idea how to do it. Having gone to private school, I can tell you they had no mechanism for being ranked against other schools. You don't know if they're uh, teaching to the curriculum. You don't know if the quality of the education is good or bad. And, and sometimes they're very just different. One part of their curriculum is really strong and one part is really weak. And so you have this really big divergence, which can be a big benefit. You're kids uh, are going to benefit from a strong science education, they don't care about history, then a school that has strength and weaknesses in those things may work out really well for them. Uh, so those are things to consider. But how do you know which ones have that? It's going to be a very difficult evaluation on your own. Most of the expats that I know personally, most of the ones that I talk to opt for homeschooling. And there's some questions around this because, of course, in lots of countries, homeschooling is not legal or it's highly regulated or it's by jurisdiction, like in Switzerland or the United States, where your state is more likely to determine what you can and can't do for education rather than the federal government, right? The cantons in Switzerland make those judgment calls, whereas in Germany, there are federal uh, level laws that keep you from homeschooling. So a bunch of things that come into play here. First of all, a large number. I would assume the majority of expats with kids who are in the country, at least at the beginning stages of their, their educational journey here in country, are technically tourists, right? They are not residents of Nicaragua. During that time, Yes, you do legally have the right to use private schools if you want to pay for them. Of course, public schools, technically, you don't. But homeschooling is nearly the assumed state. You would not expect a tourist to send their kids to private school. You'd expect them to just do something on their own. You have options, but that is normal, and that's what we find people doing all the time. If you're in that stage where you're moving around a lot, and I've talked about this a bit as a family that started uh, a journey of trying to figure out where we wanted to make our permanent home, we put in a lot of time moving from place to place and that made homeschool the only thing that would really function for our kids. Now, I know a lot of you are looking at maybe we just want to move to one place. We want to be stable. We don't want to do that moving around. And that works out great if you're able to move to a new country and be really confident that you're uh, going to be able to stay there. 
generally that's okay, uh, that you really know you've made the right choice of country, that's more difficult, and then that you also know you've made the right choice of city and area within that city that allows your kids to go to that particular school in a reasonable way. This gets a little bit harder as you do that. So, for example, here in Nicaragua, you could have moved to San Juan del Sur, said, oh, this is great, put in six months, 12 months, and then said, oh, our rent is up, this isn't the right place for us, we want to move to Granada or León, and then when you do that, you're gonna need a completely new school. You might as well be moving to a new country. You're effectively starting over. That can be very difficult. So in those cases, homeschool helps mitigate against even intra-country uh, movement as you figure out what areas and types of lifestyles are gonna make sense for you. Plus, many of the people who are coming here to Nicaragua, as an example, I don't know about every country that is taking a lot of expats, but it is popular to wanna to be off-grid or living out in the country where private schools are not available nearly all private school opportunities are in the major cities. So by uh, looking at something a little bit more alternative, you're gonna lean towards homeschooling pretty heavily just out of a practicality perspective. Now, as far as being allowed to homeschool, I personally know of no country that restricts homeschooling for tourists. This would cause a lot of problems. You decide to fly through a country, you're spending the night, you're spending a weekend, you're putting in a week on the beach, and then you find out that homeschooling is illegal there, and maybe you didn't school during that time, but your kids are homeschooled. Do they arrest you? Do they kick you out? Of course not, that would be super weird. And so the same thing goes here. If you're gonna be a tourist for a long time, which could be for six months, 12 months, 18 months, are they going to even ask you about schooling? No, absolutely not. You don't ask tourists about where their kids go to school. That's a weird thing. Is it legally something they could ask you? Of course. Is it something that any country I've ever heard of will do? No, not even the most stringent anti-homeschooling countries like Germany would ever do that. Now, in Germany, once you make that leap to being a resident, then everything changes, and they absolutely do not allow you to homeschool your kid as a resident. As a tourist, yes, when we visited Germany in 2012 and we went down the Rhine and, uh, you know, went and visited uh, uh, Munich and, and whatever, they did not care that our children were homeschooled. That would be absolutely crazy. But once they're starting to live in Germany, they're going to be renewing their, their res not their, re but the, yes, their residency, having residency and officially being children that are being stayed is staying in the country they want to make sure that they are in the public school system now they may maybe the public or private overseen by the public i don't know all the options but homeschooling is not an option in germany because they need to have that oversight uh for reasons that have completely failed and the system does not work in the way that they had hoped at all it's actually proven to be quite the opposite but germany's germany doing their own thing coming to uh nicaragua yes officially on the books citizens are required to go to school we actually don't know what the exact requirements are for residents this is actually a weird kind of gray area the reality is is that all the nicaragua in practical terms cares about is that you're properly educating your kids and that you're doing the right thing for the country. As just residents, their actual level of concern about what's being done for your kids is relatively low. Not that they don't care, but that they trust you to take care of it yourself. We homeschool, nearly everyone does. So most people, of course, when you're in that tourist mode, you're gonna be homeschooling. But as you move into becoming a resident, you have to have been homeschooling from a practical perspective in almost all cases, whether it's for six months or 12 years, you, this needs to have been happening. And so just, just from a practical standpoint, so as you move to uh, uh, becoming a resident, a few things don't change, right? Your citizenship doesn't change. Your children's citizenship doesn't change. In many cases, their residency somewhere else doesn't change. So as Americans, this is an important point to make. As Americans, we are Texan residents, even though we're not federally resident or tax resident in the United States. So as people who are both residents of Nicaragua and of Texas, technically both places have the right to claim us as far as rules for education. So in all cases that I know of, Nicaragua has completely deferred to Texas and says, well, Texas is overseeing their education. As long as Texas is okay with the education that they're getting, then Nicaragua is okay with it because they are meeting the standard of the place where they are citizens. Right now, if you became citizens of Nicaragua, sure, things would potentially change. I think you'd still have no problem uh, doing homeschool. I don't think anyone would give you a hassle about that, but can I guarantee that? No, but I can tell you that the, I've never heard of anybody getting citizenship when they had kids in 
school. Not that that couldn't happen. Of course it could. But that is not something that you would really anticipate. In most cases, if you move, even if you're just having children and you start down the path, your kids would be so far through their education system by the time you'd be even considering the residency, uh, I'm sorry, the citizenship process. Residency you'd have early, but, but citizenship would be so far down the road that uh, the chances that it would impact your kids, even if there were some rules that you had to deal with or some, some permissions you had to beg for, they would not be a big deal. That is, it cannot be guaranteed, but is nearly, nearly certain. I have never heard of a single person who had any complications when trying to give their kids a proper education. That is not, the, the country is not in a position where they want to harm your education, right? They don't want you to skimp out and not provide your children an education, of course. They don't have. They certainly have limited resources for which to track down and monitor your children. We don't want to be taking advantage of that situation. That is not the implication, but it does mean that they are not putting a lot of resources into limiting your rights and freedoms for no particular reason. They only do that when there's a very clear need to do so, like they need to protect a child from, from not getting an education or something of that nature. But as long as you're trying to do the right thing, I would have absolutely no worries or concerns uh, doing so here in Nicaragua. If And of course, things can change in the future, right? And that's an important thing to understand is anywhere, uh, everything that's going on can change. That's the nature of the world. Things change all the time. So doing what makes sense today and just being flexible and being prepared for, oh, something changes in the future. Well, you got to roll with the punches and maybe make some uh, adaptations, whether it's changing what your residence status is changing uh, your location of uh, your U.S. state, you know, maybe you need to change that, right? One of the reasons that we uh, made sure that we had Texas residency at a state level was to make sure that we had protections for uh, homeschool. Texas is great for that. If you're moving out of the United States and you live in a state that you are worried about its education rules, get to Texas. Uh, not only do you have that great education value, but you also have the uh, no state taxes thing. So you really make out really well moving from Texas, whereas moving from, for example, New York, you have both taxes and educational requirements that can really bite you. So those are things to so just be aware of. And we have other videos that have addressed that, but these things play into the education decision factors as well. So in general, the, the practical takeaway is that public school for all intents and purposes is not something to even discuss. You probably would not realistically be interested in it if you understood how it worked. And it is probably not going to be available to you regardless of your interest in it. Private schools are widely available and generally pretty good, or at least some of them that are, there's always pretty good ones available, but almost none are going to be in English uh, first at least. And so if you need a school that uh, you need to be sending your kids to a private school where they're able to work in English and learn Spanish once there, your options are going to be very limited. They will exist, but they are very limited. And you're probably looking at just a few different locations where you have lots of expats. But if you want to do homeschooling, assume that that will always be open and available to you without the slightest problem. Here, we've had to do literally nothing about homeschool. Maybe some people have had to register something or tell somebody or have had to have discussions about it or whatever. And I'd love to see those comments of anyone who's had anything like this come up. Uh, what, what is it that triggered it? How did, you know, whatever. Um, but having been here for a long time and having a channel where we talk about this, never has it come up. Has someone said, oh no, you're, you know, and this actually comes up in New York. Oh, you're over-educating your kids. You're giving them too much of an opportunity. We want them held back if they're not in the public school, right? None of that kind of weirdness happens here. You really do. If you're trying to do the right thing. Nicaragua is trying to help you do the right thing. Everyone wins here, right? So Nicaraguan society wins. You win. Your children win. This is only winners. They're not out to harm themselves just to harm you. That is crazy. And I know lots of other countries, a lot of people are moving here because they're coming from countries that do that. They're not looking to do that here. So uh, rationality, practicality, these things tend to win the day here in Nicaragua. And I was just saying uh, to a friend of mine who's moving down and coming down to visit in a few weeks, already has some property. And um, she was looking at some supposed Nicaraguan laws online and it's something completely crazy and impractical. And I said, here's just a general rule. One, don't look online for Nicaraguan laws. We had that video yesterday. You know, if you're not talking to a lawyer, do not. Don't do the research. Don't look it up. It will be wrong. It'll be out of date. It'll be completely false. It'll be from a, you know, someone trying to trick you. It's just setting yourself up for failure. Don't try to do that. But if you do look at a Nicaragua law or something claiming to be a Nicaragua law and say that thing doesn't make any logical sense. 
assume that it is not a Nicaragua law. Every time we actually see a Nicaragua law, it takes very little effort to say, whoa, this makes sense because, right, whether it's a change or an old law, whatever, it, there tends to be a very straightforward reason for it. There aren't all these laws that are completely crazy. But when you're coming from a lot of other countries, not most, but certain other countries, there's a very high trend of their laws not really making sense, not being based in what's good for society, not based in logic, more based in emotional reaction or individual power players getting something that they individually want or someone reacting negatively to an event like the donkey in the bathtub laws, things like that, things that make no sense to actually have as laws, but weird little jurisdictions. You get one judge who, you know, doesn't like the way things are done, doesn't like his neighbor, and so makes a law uh, to affect them. That kind of stuff doesn't really happen here, but in certain places it does. So when you come from those kinds of places, it's easy to be misled by people saying, oh, no, Nicaragua does crazy things too. Why wouldn't they do crazy things, right? You're used to people doing crazy things. It seems reasonable, but it's not reasonable here. So that's just a, a good rule of thumb. If you're, if you're doing smart, good things, no one's being hurt, you're doing the right thing. Nicaragua, even if they have a rule that says that's not how it's supposed to work, chances are you can talk to someone and be like, okay, I know there's this rule, but I'm, I'm doing the right thing. And, and quite often there's some way to get approval or, or work around it or, or figure out some technicality that you just weren't aware of. And that's why lawyers are important, not just reading laws on your own and trying to interpret them in your own context, because context is a really big deal. Part two for today is talking about the melancholy of being an expat. And this is really kind of just a personal story for me, but I think it'll apply to people. And we so often talk about the amazing things that happen when you become an expat. Oh, you get to explore a new country. You get to learn a new language. You get to have adventure in every day of your life. You get to adjust and, and tweak the, the big things that you don't normally think about getting to change in your life and changing them to be better for you. Changing things like your weather, changing things like your legal structure, changing things like your freedoms. And, and so forth, and things that really, really amazing that you basically don't get to, to even address in any meaningful way unless you become an expat. So expats have all this great stuff to talk about, but there's negatives as well. For one for me, and I'll just tell this as kind of an anecdote. Last night, I was, uh, I don't dream very often. I had this dream where I was back in the Hudson Valley. And for those who don't know, my eldest daughter, who just turned 16, you can see where I probably had an emotional prompt to this, uh, was born. We had, uh, my wife and I are both New Yorkers, ourselves born in upstate New York. And at the time I was working in uh, on Wall Street, we were living in downtown Newark, New Jersey, and we, we were pregnant with our first child. And we said, you know what, our kid is not going to be born in New Jersey. We're both New Yorkers. We want our kids to be New Yorkers. Uh, so we moved to the Hudson Valley. We bought a house and moved to the Hudson Valley. We didn't get to live in the Hudson Valley for a really long time, but we did live there when my youngest was born. She was born there. Uh, we eventually moved away. And then at a few years later, we moved back. So both of my children got a chance to live there and at least a little bit do remember it. But we didn't stay there a long time. But we do have some really fond memories, of course. It's a place where we had our first child. Both of our children were very small there. A lot of important life events took place in the Hudson Valley. And of course, the Hudson Valley is just a really beautiful, nice area, even if it's expensive and stuff. It's got a lot going for it. So in this dream, I was talking to my daughters and just expressing that we were no longer going to have ties to the Hudson Valley and in a very real uh, way, talking about that we were expats and living abroad and uh, that without these ties, without a reason to come back, this is a place that's very far from family, very far from anybody, any reason to be back there. And with no longer having ties, and this kind of ties into we a few years ago, sold our house that was there. We kept it for a really long time, uh, hoping the market would get better, hoping that maybe we'd move back or whatever. Uh, we were really uh, tied to it, even if we weren't there for a long time. It always seemed like we'd go back. But once we sold that house, once we moved away, and now my daughter turning 16, those things kind of came together. And in this dream, I said to my daughter, you know, we really, we don't have ties to this anymore. We'll probably never see the Hudson Valley again. And it stuck with me how, not just that, not just the Hudson Valley as a place where my one daughter was born, but also uh, Carrollton and Irving, Texas, where my other daughter was born. And that's where for the longest time we had the house where my kids grew up more than anywhere else. That's where those those childhood memories of playing with toys and, uh, you know, developmental years, that was more in Texas than any other specific spot. We moved around Europe a lot. A lot of those places were relatively short, so they didn't have the same kind of uh, anchor. Uh, but those are both places I'll probably never see again as an expat who now lives abroad. There's no reason for me to go back there except to go for a really long trip just to go 
remember a house. And my daughter said she'd love to go back to the Hudson Valley. And even if she doesn't get to go in, she wants to stand in the parking lot and see the house that she was born in. And, uh, you know, my other daughter has ex expressed how much she misses the house. She doesn't want to move back to Texas, but she misses that house because that was our house. That was the place uh, that, uh, that she really thinks of as growing up. And for me, the farmhouse that I had as a small child, that was torn down long ago. So long, long ago, I separated myself from ever getting to see it roughly 40 years ago. But the farm that I grew up on uh, all through those years and the house we had after that has been sold. I'll probably never drive past it again. Maybe, maybe I'll drive past. Maybe I'll even get a video for you guys. But at most, that's all that's ever going to happen. Uh, so much of those pieces of my childhood are gone. Even though my father still lives in the region, many of those things I'll never see again. Ithaca, New York, where my wife and I met and lived for years, probably we will never see again. Uh, the, the Maritimes in Canada, where my wife and I honeymooned, where I traveled as a teenager, we always wanted to take our kids there, but practically we'll probably never see it again. And of course, Bar Harbor, Maine, where I used to go every other year with my parents when I was young, as you know, our family vacations, I have not been there in so long. My wife has never made it. The last time that I went to Bar Harbor was before she and I were together. And now, realistically, I will never take my kids. I will never see it again. Of course, it, like many places, has changed dramatically. And going back wouldn't be as meaningful as it seems. A few years ago, we were driving from New York to Texas, and we decided to take the shortcut through Canada, and I managed to go through Michigan. I took a small detour, about an hour or two, went up to Flint and drove past the old house that I lived at uh, when I went to university uh, in Flint, Michigan in 1994, 1995, and uh, that was really weird for me because I didn't know that I would ever see it again. I didn't know I'd ever see Michigan again, and uh, seeing that house was it really brought a lot back. But that was an example of like really losing touch with places that you've lived. I've lived all over the United States. I've lived all over Europe. I've lived in multiple places in Latin America. And in, in doing so, as an expat now especially, uh, I am so far away from the places that I, I have lived in and have meaningful memories from in the past. Oh, and also, I had to mention this, another trigger to this memory. I'm sure I was in Belize uh, just a few days ago and I was at this restaurant that just brought back memories of the diner in Peekskill, uh, where my wife and I used to eat more than anywhere else when we were there. And uh, there was also, and this is very funny, there was a Guatemalan restaurant in Peekskill. That was our introduction to Central American food. Later, when we moved to Texas, there was also a Guatemalan bakery. We lived in Little Salvador. So we, we got really steeped in Central American culture in Texas. But in New York, we actually had this Guatemalan bakery, and, or, I'm sorry, restaurant, and we used to go there. And that's where we got to know a lot of stuff. So when we then uh, came to Nicaragua, we had like this little bit of familiarity from that. And those are just memories that have come back. But I was in this place in Belize and it reminded me of this place in Peekskill. And that was, a, I had not thought of that restaurant in so long. So living, while I, I constantly talk about these wonderful, positive, amazing impacts of being expats and why I love being an expat and how it empowers my life and makes every day of my life better. There are things that may also happen if you're not an expat, of course. Uh, if I was living back home, never moved away, some places like places I'd worked, places I went to university, places that we honeymooned, places that we vacationed may end up being impractically far or in a jurisdiction that becomes complicated. And so we'd probably never go back. But living even farther away and importantly, giving up uh, our ability to spend a lot Lots of time in the United States makes it very difficult for us. If I wanted to go to Bar Harbor and, and take my kids there, that would take an immense amount of work and cost just to say, oh, here's a place that I used to go when I was little. And they'd be like, okay, yeah, I like or don't like this place, but I don't care that you were here when you were little. It doesn't matter to us. But that nostalgia for me is lost. Uh, and so I was having a melancholy moment thinking about how being an expat does create these situations where there are these places that we really can't go back to. They say you can't go home again. In these cases, it's real. You can't go home again. You, you, just, you just don't have those options. Uh, or, or it's so impractical that you might as well not. And in all these cases, if I made an effort, I could go see all these things, or at least what's left of them. But I know that the money and the time aren't worth it. And, and while it would be neat to be at any one of them, 
it would only be good for 30 minutes, for an hour. And then I'd say, okay, I've seen this again. Why did I spend so much to see it? But if I lived back home, it would be trivial and I may go past them on a regular basis. And my family in Ohio, I, it's an entire region. There's a good chance I'll never see Ohio again, which growing up, I didn't grow up in Ohio, but m most of my family did. And so being in Ohio all the time to see them every Easter, every Thanksgiving, sometimes at Christmas, all right, those are things that just don't exist anymore for me. And uh, our last time in Ohio was quite some time ago. It's already been many years. We were there for my grandmother's funeral. Uh, in 2017, we were actually there, right? We actually, we had to leave early. We had a flight to Italy uh, when we were moving to Italy and, and we had meant to stop and see my grandmother on the way and she died the day before we were going to leave. Uh, so we had to go quickly so that we could be there for the funeral instead of getting to visit with her. But that was seven and a half years ago, just about eight years ago. I have not seen Ohio already for eight years. There's so many of these parts of our lives that we've not seen already for so long, which in some ways makes it easier. We've already trimmed it off, but there's so many places that it would be nice to not have given up that sense of place uh, that, that you often have. And of course, we're building a new life here in Nicaragua and no place that I've ever lived felt as much like home as here in Nicaragua. So that's very special for me. Like I have this sense of being in the place that I'm supposed to be in that I've not really had previously. But all these old pieces, as someone in their late 40s, I'm nearly 50 years old. I have over 40 years of my life around the world, not here in Nicaragua. And, and those things to me are mostly lost. Now, some of them are not lost, right? We can go back and rent the house that we used to have in Romania, in Greece, in Spain. We could go back to the same village, possibly the same house, and, and relive some of those memories. And sometimes we think we will, especially in Greece. We know exactly the house that we had. I looked at it just the other day. And, uh, you know, I really want to go back and spend time in that house again. But... Uh, uh, by and large, most of these places slip through our fingers and slip through the hourglass of time uh, and just aren't things that we get to keep. So that is a thing that I've noted in my own life has been, I don't know if negative is the right term, but certainly gives a melancholy feeling and makes me nostalgic for a lot of the physical places and restaurants and roads and, and parks and, and playgrounds and things that we used to use when we were younger and when my kids were younger. Um, and I do wish we could visit them again. But would they actually care? Does actually having access to those things provide a great benefit? I don't know, but it's a trade-off that you have to make. Anyway, thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. I'll put the link on the screen. And of course, all the information is down in the show notes. Anything you need, contact me, uh, support the channel, all that stuff. And as always, love getting feedback and questions and stuff from you guys. So scroll down and say hi, if nothing else, leave your comments. And I love it when people send in videos like Brent did the other day so we can add them to the show and make it you know, connect you guys together. Hoping to be able to do the live stream this week on Thursday. Last week was Thanksgiving, so we skipped it. Plus, I was traveling. This week was nuts, uh, but I missed doing that, so I'm looking forward to getting back to that. We had technical glitches the week before that, so we didn't do a long one, so I'm feeling a little bit like we've missed out a little bit. And uh, with that, I will see all of you tomorrow.